Hello. We want to get started. Uh, we have a short period of time in this uh, very interesting uh, subject. Uh, this is the second in a series of the Mayor Reports uh, in conjunction with the Holocaust Human Rights and Education Center. Uh, this actually came about because of an incident in the uh, village of Amaranek last Halloween when uh, swastikas was uh, sprayed uh, on the uh, village of Amaranek and other symbols which were you know, silly, but uh, it certainly highlighted the reason uh, for this program. Uh, it's a continuing education and uh, as the expression goes, never forget. Uh, and I also never forget that a politician shouldn't talk too long. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, I'd like to, um, of course we have Dan McMillan who is a, a very well qualified uh, lecturer and uh, expert on this area. And as I noted before, as we were eating dinner, I introduced him as Mrs. McMillan's son, the author. His mother drank there, which is very good. Um, I would uh, like to call up uh, Valerie, who is, uh, I consider my mentor locally. It's very good. Oh, and the other thing is, there is a book signing. The books are available for $28, and it will be signed. It's 28 25, just got a discount. Thank you, Norman. This is for like Luau Cinder or somebody. Queen Elizabeth would be down below this thing. Um, it's a delight to be able to share with the Village of Mamaroneck the sponsorship of the lecture tonight. Mr. McMillan is a very well qualified and has written a very interesting book that is easy to understand but a great scholarly insight. He grew up in. Uh, Short Hills, New Jersey. He went to the public high school in Short Hills, New Jersey, where at a young age he took an interest in the study of the German language. He began to study on his own. He then went to get an undergraduate degree at Stanford University where he con continued in uh, German and in history. He has a PhD in history from Columbia and also a law degree from Fordham University. He, in his academic career, he has taught at um, Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, in Eastern Illinois University, and I can't remember the town, I think it's Johnston. It's Charleston. Charleston, yeah. and a few other places. So <clears throat> he's pulled this book together. It's extremely rational, readable, and it's the result of a long, rumination on his part about the causes of the Holocaust, which he started to think about when he was 14 or 15 years old. So we, we welcome you, we thank the mayor, and let me present uh, Professor Dan McMillan. Thank you, Valerie. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to I want to ask you a question. All right. You look at the Holocaust, you look at these unimaginably horrific things that human beings did to each other. Could you do that? Are you capable of that level of cruelty, of that kind of moral depravity? From where I sit, the answer to this question is obvious. The answer to this question is clearly yes. And equally clearly, the answer to this question is no. So my goal tonight is to make sense of that paradox for you. I'm going to talk for half an hour about why the Holocaust happened. I'm presenting to you the central argument of my book. And then I will take 14 minutes to talk about why the Holocaust frightens us like no other historical event. There's a long running debate about whether or not the Holocaust qualifies as in some sense unique. I argue with considerable conviction that the Holocaust absolutely was in a class by itself not only among episodes of genocide and atrocity, but among all historical events. And I'll explain to you why I think this is so. I will, I will then pause to take questions from you. We will have 40 minutes for questions. And then I will take six minutes at the end to tie things together and give you my conclusions. So that is the agenda for our time together this evening. And I want to turn now first to the question, why the Holocaust happened? Uh, as, as Valerie indicated to you, I have been thinking about this question for about 40 years now. I, I first began to think about the Holocaust as a teenager growing up in suburban New Jersey in a town very much like Mamaroneck. Um, and I read a book by Simon Wiesenthal, the hunter of Nazi war criminals, called The Murderers Among Us, about his experiences. And it made a very powerful impression upon me. And it gave me a question that has never left me and that became the title of my own book. How could this happen? 
And the, the wording is significant. I was just discussing this with Millie Jasper over dinner, actually. The, and, and so many other people have said to me, yes, that title is perfect. That is exactly how the question should be phrased. Because any other historical event, Protestant Reformation, the French Revolution, the American Civil War, we say, how interesting. I wonder why that happened. That's not the question we ask about the Holocaust. The question we ask about the Holocaust is, how could something this horrific have been possible? And I wanted an answer to this question. And the desire for the answer, I'm not saying that I was doing this purposefully across 40 years, but that question never left me. And the desire for an answer to that question shaped a lot of the future course of my life. It's a big reason why I took up the study of the German language in high school. I was fortunate then to meet probably the most important mentor I've encountered in my entire intellectual career, which was my high school German teacher, Rosa Speer, who was uh, a German-Jewish refugee from Hamburg. Her family had escaped uh, Germany just a few months before the outbreak of the Second World War. She was uh, a fantastically capable teacher of foreign languages. She also taught Spanish at, at Melbourne High School. And this is very, very important because if you've ever studied German, you know that it's extremely difficult. And she was, I, thanks to her, I made enough progress in high school that I did not give up on the language and went on to study it in college. And equally important, like so many Jewish Germans, which is really the correct way of describing them, of her generation, she had a very deep appreciation for the tremendous intellectual and cultural achievements of the German people and inspired us with enthusiasm for these achievements. And these contributions to the Western tradition make this question, how could this happen, all the more compelling. I mean, it's frightening enough that this happened in any country, but that it happened precisely in this society, this linguistic community, which you could well argue, at least in intellectual and cultural terms, made greater contributions to human progress in the last three centuries than any other. So with my fascination with the Holocaust strengthened and at least with some competence in German. I majored in history and German in college, went on to do my doctorate in German history at Columbia, studying under Fritz Stern, and worked as a history professor for a number of years. Why did the Holocaust affect me so powerfully from the very beginning at a young age? It affected me so powerfully because I experienced it then as I experience it today as a direct attack on the meaning, the significance, the value of my own life. I could not articulate this at the time. I could not articulate it for decades thereafter. But on an, on an intuitive level, maybe here is more accurate, I, I sensed, I recognized that in the Holocaust something unique had happened. The killers had made a very determined statement that individual human life is without any inherent value whatsoever. All right, this human life gets devalued in every war and every atrocity and every genocide, but there's also some partial notion that the victims still have some value and some, dis some distinction between those who are, who are murdered and those who are spared in the Holocaust. This negation of human life was uncompromising and it was total. And I will argue later in my presentation that this is the source of the special fear that the Holocaust inspires in everyone who encounters it. Turning now more directly to the question that my book tries to answer, how could this happen? There's a short answer. And that is that the murderers held certain beliefs about their victims, about the Jewish people. To help you understand what these beliefs were, I want to quote to you from a speech given by Heinrich Himmler. As you know, Himmler was the head of the SS. And the SS was the paramilitary organization of the Nazi party that planned, that organized, that carried out the German government's attempt to murder every single person of Jewish ancestry on the European continent. <coughs> what we have come to know is the Holocaust. On the 4th of October of 1943, in the city of Poznan, in German-occupied Poland, Himmler took the stage. His audience was a group of several hundred high-ranking SS officers. And in part, this is what he said. He said, I want to talk to you quite frankly about a very grave matter. We could speak about it frankly among ourselves, and yet we will never discuss it publicly. I'm referring to the extermination of the Jewish people. This is one of those things which are easy to talk about. The Jewish people will be exterminated, says every Nazi party comrade. And then Himmler complains, but then they come trudging in, the 80 million worthy Germans, and each one produces his decent Jew. That is, he felt 
that, weren't, that most Germans would want to make, they would support the policy as a whole, they would want to make an exception, spare the life of this or that Jewish individual that they'd known personally and had come to like and admire. Yet for even this minimal degree of compassion for one's fellow human being, Himmler had nothing but contempt. He said, not one of those who talk like that, that is, those who would make exceptions for good individuals, not one of those who talk like that has watched it happening. Not one of them has been through it. Most of you will know what it means when 500 corpses are lying side by side, or when 1,000 corpses are lying there. To have stuck it out and to have remained decent, this is what has made us hard. After, after having thus expressed his profound pride in what they had done, Himmler went on to explain why these murders had, in his view, been necessary. We know how difficult we would have made it for ourselves if, on top of the bombing raids and the burdens and deprivations of war, we still had Jews in every town as secret saboteurs, as agitators, as troublemakers. We had the moral right, we had the duty to our people to destroy this people which wanted to destroy us. We have exterminated a bacterium because we do not want in the end to be infected by the bacterium and die of it. All in all, we can say that we have fulfilled this most difficult duty for the love of our people. So he, he made really two, two claims about himself and his accomplices, and secondly, about the people they were murdering. What did they believe about their victims? They believed that the Jewish people were a race, biologically and genetically distinct from the rest of humanity, almost to the point of being a separate species, and that they were genetically hardwired to behave in a destructive fashion, that foremost among these allegedly inborn destructive behaviors of the Jewish people was a tendency to want to divide and conquer the societies in which they lived by fostering division, by setting social class against social class. And this is what Himmler is alluding to when he says that that Jews, if left alive in Germany during World War II, would cripple the German war effort because they would be acting in every town as secret saboteurs, agitators, and troublemakers, is what he's talking about. And their principal method, according to Hitler and Himmler and the SS, in sowing all this conflict in society was, was promoting the spread of Marxism with its theory of inevitable class struggle. Jews were supposedly responsible for the rise of socialist and communist parties, and supposedly controlled the world's communist parties in a vast Jewish Marxist conspiracy. Consequently, if the influence of the Jewish people in society and politics could be eliminated, the communist threat to Germany would be forever banished. Germany would be safe from it. These are the assumptions, the ideas that led most directly to the Holocaust. This is what they were talking about. These beliefs about the victims in turn raise three fundamental questions which concern us. First, where could such ideas have come from? Secondly, how could people who subscribe to such beliefs have come to power in what was arguably the most advanced human society, certainly the most literate, the most learned? Secondly, and third, why were so many highly educated Germans, most of whom were not committed members of the Nazi party, who were not fanatics, nonetheless willing to commit mass murder in the service of these ideas? I, just, I address all three questions in my book. They structure my presentation of the, of the causes of this event. I want to be today brief on where these ideas came from and equally brief on how Hitler could have come to power and focus the bulk of my discussion on the third question, that is, what were the, the ideas, the circumstances, the experiences that made hundreds of thousands of psychologically normal men and some women willing, and in many cases quite eager, to become mass murderers. So turning first to the first of these three questions, where do these ideas come from? The anti-Semitism that produced the Holocaust basically boils down to two ideas. The Jewish people are a race, and they are responsible for Marxism. The equation of Jews and Marxism um, has many possible sources. One is Karl Marx's Jewish ancestry. A second is the demonization of the Jewish people in the, by the Christian churches across many centuries before Hitler came to power in which the Jews are presented as the instruments of Satan. You can see this as kind of a paving the way for the secular theories of a diabolical international Jewish communist conspiracy in the 20th century. And another source of this 
what supported these theories of an international Jewish conspiracy was the fact that the Jews were the most international of all minorities with Jewish communities in every country. And this laid them open to the accusation, oh, they're not loyal to us here in Germany or to the French or wherever they live, they're loyal to each other the world over in this imaginary Jewish world conspiracy. As to the question, the idea of the Jews as biologically distinct as a race, that is not at all difficult to explain where that came from. We have to remember in making sense of this that 80 and 70 years ago, educated people throughout the Western world viewed racism very differently than the way that we view it today. Today, racism is for losers. It's the prejudice of the uneducated, of people who are unsuccessful in life. But 70 and 80 years ago, racism was not for losers. Racis racism was for the heads of major corporations. It was for professors at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. It was for senators. It was for presidents of the United States. They were open about it. They were proud of it. It was seen as hard scientific fact. And there was a consensus and among all these edu educated people in all these countries, not just in Germany, that Every ethnicity, every nationality is a race. You know, Polish, Jewish, Greek, Italian, Scotch, Irish, French, German, and so on. They're all each a race. Each race has its distinctive genetic signature. Each race has its distinctive inborn characteristics. Some races are clearly smarter than others. Some races in moral terms are better than others. And this racist consensus made it really quite easy for the Nazis to arrive at this fantasy of the Jewish people as genetically unique and uniquely destructive. In sum, the, the train of thought that led to the Holocaust is the Jews have created this terrible communist threat of which we are also frightened. Uh, they have done so because their genetic makeup compels them to do this. Because this is inborn behavior, no, there's, it is not possible to re-educate them, to pressure them, to persuade them to behave differently, and consequently the only solution to this imaginary problem was to eliminate them. That's the train of thought that, that made this happen. Turning now to the question, how do these people who believe this come to power? This is an enormously complex question about, about which thousands, well, many hundreds in any rate books have been written. But in, 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 a, in a large, in, in, it actually, of the very largest part of this question of, of how this was possible for Hitler to come to power, it boils down to two simple facts. And these were first that the Great Depression struck Germany with exceptional fury. Unemployment rose to 30% in the months before Hitler came to power. And equally important that the German voters in their great majority did not respect, accept, value the democratic form of government, were not the least bit committed to it. Why were Germans not committed to democracy in the way that, for example, American voters at the same time in the same depression were committed to democracy? Well, part of it was just democracy came so late to the Germans. Only in 1919, they did not have enough time to get used to it. And even worse, their first experience of democracy was all bad. The first five years, as you know, the first German democracy was called the Weimar Republic. Its first five years were racked by a series of traumatic events, events that would have shaken the best established political system. You, you know these events, you're familiar with them. Germany losing World War I, the, first, the Versailles Treaty, which was perceived as so unfair to Germany, the hyperinflation of the early 1920s that wiped out the savings of much of the German middle class, shocking levels of political violence, including the assassination of two cabinet ministers. The end game comes on the 6th of November of 1932. This is the last free election held in Germany until after World War II. Incidentally, um, one day before my mother was born and two days before Franklin Delano Roosevelt became our president. Um, we have an electorate that is absolutely desperate amid 30% unemployment and that has never been terribly enthusiastic about democracy, has felt in the first three years of the depression that this democracy has failed to address their suffering, uh, who are really quite hostile to democracy. By this point, we should not be surprised that these voters made a terrible choice. They voted in their majority for extremist political parties that were violently authoritarian, on the left the communists, on the right the Nazis. And this polarization of the political spectrum paralyzed the government and gave Adolf Hitler his opening. So, we understand the basics of where Nazi anti-Semitism came from and how these Nazis could have come to power. 
And now we're in January of 1933, and Adolf Hitler is Chancellor of Germany, and the persecution of German Jews is about to begin. And yet the causes I've explained to you so far, they only take us up to this point, to 1933. They don't take us all the way to 1941 when the Holocaust began. They don't add up to genocide. They, they explain discrimination, they don't explain murder. And this is crucial because every human society has discriminated against minorities. As you know, our country is no exception, right? Only a few human societies in specific points in time have perpetrated genocide. And so we need to return to the third question I put to you. Why were so many psychologically normal, highly accomplished, educated Germans willing to become mass murderers in the surface of this fantastical theory about the Jewish people? We have to look for the radicalizing factors that made possible the great leap from discrimination in 1933 to genocide in 1941. In my view, there are four factors that stand out that taken together remove the inhibition on the taking of human life and gave Adolf Hitler such an exaggerated degree of power over his own people that he could implement any policy, no matter how criminal. The first of these four factors I've already mentioned, it's this biological racism. It was made it possible to define the Jewish people as almost a separate species, less than fully human, and thereby to rob them of their humanity, which made it much easier to murder them. This dehumanization of the Jewish people was massively reinforced and worsened in its impact by the second radicalizing factor. That is the First World War. Ten million young men lost their lives in pointless combat in that war. Two million of those young men were German. And for very many who lived through that experience, and it's relevant that Adolf Hitler was a veteran of four years of the Western Front, all human life lost an enormous amount of its value. It, it just lowered the bar for violence in Europe. It set a precedent for a kind of violence that in the Europe of 1914 before that war would have been sheerly unimaginable and in 1918 after that war could seem almost, almost ordinary and unremarkable. The third radicalizing factor is the way that the German people deified Adolf Hitler. And you really have to use the word deification. Popularity is just not an adequate term. They worshipped him, not all of them, but millions, probably tens of millions. They saw him as a genius. They thought his powers, his abilities were superhuman at a minimum. Many thought he was super of, of supernatural abilities, thought he had an intimate connection with divine providence, which is how he saw himself. Uh, among those who were already his followers in the Nazi party, this myth of Hitler's magical qualities was enough to inspire in them a loyalty so fanatical that they would happily do anything he asked. And among a much larger set of Germans, this belief, some belief in Hitler's magical qualities was enough to at least neutralize whatever objections, whatever misgivings they might have felt about his more radical policies, including what he was doing to their Jewish neighbors. Where this, this, this myth of Hitler's brilliance and genius comes from is, on first impression, it's very hard to understand because we now know, as, we, as we've been able to really go over his biography, Hitler was actually, in, in almost every respect, a thoroughgoing mediocrity, a very unimpressive individual. He had one talent, which was public speaking, that he was able to leverage and, and, and make his way into politics. But on closer inspection, Hitler's popularity, the deification of Hitler, is not at all difficult to understand. Hitler was wildly popular, was worshipped, was admired, because he was fabulously successful. Now the terrible irony is, and this is an example of the, of the role of, of luck in history, the terrible irony is that most of Hitler's triumphs came not from any ability on his part, they came from dumb luck. <coughs> but he had from entering office in 1933 all the way until the German armies failed to take Moscow in 1941, which was his first setback, an eight-year uninterrupted string of successes, and some of these successes were so spectacular they would convince anyone he was a miracle worker. I will just give you two examples. These are the two examples that were most important to Germans at that time. The first is he comes to power in 1933. Unemployment is at 30%. Now think about how terrifying that must have been. Think about what it was like in our country five years ago when unemployment topped 10%, 30%. It was about 25% in the United States at the time that FDR was sworn in. Only four years later, 1937, Germany has returned to full employment. 
And do any of you know where we were in 1937? We were in high double-digit unemployment. We didn't get out of double-digit unemployment until war production kicked us out of the Great Depression in 1941. Germany is the only major industrial economy to climb out of the Great Depression during the, in the 1930s. The second triumph on Hitler's part, even more seemingly miraculous than the end to unemployment, May 10, 1940, he unleashes the German forces against France, Belgium, and Holland. They conquer and occupy France. They drive the, Germ the British armies clean off the continent of Europe with, with their tail between their legs in the Dunkirk boat lift. They do this in only six weeks of fighting. They lose only 30,000 German soldiers killed. Now compare this, as any German of that generation necessarily did, compare this to the German experience in the First World War. They fought the same enemies. But they didn't fight for six weeks. They fought for four long and bitter years. They didn't lose 30,000 of their young men. They lost two million, and they lost the war. And I submit to you that measured against this yardstick to any people, any nation, not just Germans, Hitler would have appeared to be a miracle worker. And this enabled him to do so many things that he could not otherwise have done, including the Holocaust. The final radicalizing factor that, that amplified Hitler's power and removed whatever remaining inhibition on killing that might have been left among many Ger you know, Germans was the Second World War, the war that Hitler began. In Europe alone, 30 million people lose their lives in that war. That includes the six million victims of the Holocaust. On the one hand, a war on that scale massively increases the power of any central government, any political leader. We see this, saw this in our country as well during World War II, for example. And on the other hand, it's a, a context so violent that it makes it possible to radicalize the Nazi policy toward the Jewish people to the ultimate degree of violence. And there's something else that I want to share with you. And this is not specific to the Holocaust at all. And it is, it is unfortunately universally human. We human beings, the great majority of us, we have no moral compass. What I mean by that is that all of us here in this room learned early enough in life, before we left grade school, the difference between right and wrong. And the difference between right and wrong is not rocket science. It's not mysterious. The problem is when circumstances change dramatically enough, people adjust to these circumstances and begin to behave in ways that they once thought were profoundly immoral. And when the people around us start doing this, do we stand up and say, halt? Do we stand out in the crowd and say, stop? No, we don't. We go along to get along. What we do is we adjust ourselves to the new circumstances by rewriting our moral code. We just redefine what's right and wrong in order to fit our needs in the, in the new circumstances. We def, you know, the psychological mechanisms by which this happens are well known. We defer unthinkingly to authority figures. A lot of you will be familiar with Stanley Milgram experiments, Milgram's obedience experiments at Yale, for example. We conform to the behavior of the people around us. If we are assigned a new role to play, we adopt the moral code that seems appropriate to that role. And psychological experiments have demonstrated this depressing truth time and time and time again. I will give you one example. In 1971, on the campus of Stanford University, the philosophy professor Philip Zimbardo constructed a mock prison in the basement of a building. He wanted to do an experiment in the psychology of prison behavior. And he recruited 20 young men. And he subjected these men to a battery of psychological tests to weed out all who were really abnormal in any way, the, nat the sadists the authoritarian personalities, the history professors, for example. <laughs> and so what he got for the study was 20 especially nice, normal young men. He divided them into the roles of prisoner and guard. He planned an experiment to last two weeks. After only six days, Zimbardo had to shut the experiment down in a hurry, in a panic, and send them all home because the guards had become sadistic and were abusing the prisoners, and the prisoners were so terrified by the guards that two of these young men were headed for a nervous breakdown. The point here is this demonstrates a very powerful mechanism, the ability of a role that someone has to play and how that role reshapes perceptions, reshapes psychology, reshapes morality. And what's all the more impressive about what this experiment proves to us is that all these young men knew this was make-believe. They knew it wasn't a real prison. They knew it was only going to last two weeks. For that matter, they knew they were free to walk off the set at any time if they didn't know what, like the way things were going. And nonetheless, 
The make-believe role of prison guard was powerful enough to turn perfectly nice young men into sadists within a matter of days. So it, is not it should not surprise us, therefore, that real circumstances that were very powerful, namely World War II, where all these people are dying, and a real role in a Nazi organization with a real uniform and a real gun, were enough to turn plenty of perfectly ordinary young men into mass murderers. I, by the way, and I, and I do need to emphasize that this is not in any way an exculpation, an excuse for their actions. One thing that, that has to be very clearly understood, and not everyone knows this, is that n none of the Germans in the Holocaust at any rate, we're not so sure necessarily about the Eastern European collaborators, but no German in the Holocaust who, who participated in murder in any capacity was under any kind of duress. And there are, there are plenty of cases of people who refused, who, who opted out for one reason or another. Not only were they not punished, they, it didn't even affect the, their careers, their advancement. And in all the post-war trials that have been conducted of perpetrators, not once has a defense attorney ever been able to come up with a single case of someone who was punished for refusing to become a murderer. So I do, I do want to emphasize that. But what we've learned from the Stanford prison experiment, from the lack of moral compass that we human beings are prey to, that it is our flaw, brings us back to the question I put to you at the beginning of our conversation. Could you do this? Well, the answer to this question is yes, in the limited sense that you're human. And because we're all human in this room, very few of us, if any, has a moral compass. And therefore, we are capable, we can be made to do anything. If we are educated with the wrong ideas, placed under control of the wrong government, if we are placed in the wrong circumstances, particularly major warfare, which is a, a necessary context almost for genocide. The good news, on the other hand, is that in our country, in this day and age, as in the rest of the world's established democracies, which are listed as a number, about 25 in number with 800 million citizens, in none of these advanced societies, stable democracies, uh, are any of us going to really be educated in the wrong ideas? We're not under the wrong kind of government. We're not going to be placed in the wrong kinds of circumstances. And thus, in this rather more, <coughs> for me, more important sense, the answer to our question is no. I mean, no one in this room, look around you, is remotely capable of participating in genocide. And I don't think you need me to tell you that. But let me try to just briefly outline why I think this is so. First, the ideas. Racism and anti-Semitism are very much with us. We all know that. But it's very different from 80 years ago. These ideas are no longer respectable. You express these ideas in public, you are likely to lose your job. This is crucial. Secondly, we live in stable democracies. Democracies don't perpetrate genocide. It is dictatorships that perpetrate <coughs> genocide. We can think of all kinds of reasons why that's so. But the most obvious is, are you really going to find an electoral majority for mass murder? It's a preposterous notion. Okay, we have had majorities in this country for discrimination, but murder? It's just, it's inconceivable. And third, we're not coming off a war where we've lost many million of our young men in pointless fighting, nor are we likely to fight a war with those kinds of casualties in future. And consequently, we value human life in a way that all too many people in the 1930s and 1940s did not. For these reasons and for many, many others that I could add, uh, I feel safe in saying that you know, we in the world's established democracies are safe from genocide in the sense that we are not at all candidates for being <coughs> victims of it or perpetrators of it. Uh, this does not imply in any way that, that, that we should let up on Holocaust education or the teaching of the evils of racism because that's how we got to where we are, to being, to being safe from this. But uh, this is, this is a, I suppose, cold comfort for those of of, you know, for the millions of human beings, billions who live in the developing world where genocide is very much a threat and for many a part of their future. But we in the democracies are safe from it and I feel I can say that with complete confidence. And yet, having said that, you know, I can go, I can go on all day giving you facts and figures and making reasoned arguments. But no matter what the concepts are clear in our minds, the arguments and the facts that are clear in our minds. When we look at the Holocaust, in our, in our hearts there's fear. 
And if we want to think clearly about the Holocaust, if we want to understand what it does and does not say about who we are and what kind of future lies in, in store for us, we have to at least understand the source of this fear so that we can better manage it. And so for the last 12 minutes of my initial presentation to you, 12 to 14 minutes, I, I want to uh, address the question, what is it about the Holocaust that makes it uniquely frightening? I want to tell you a story. This is an incident that took place in Treblinka. And we learned about this incident from interviews conducted in 1971 by the journalist Gita Sereni with a man named Franz Stangl. Stangl had been the commandant, the commanding officer, at two death camps in German-occupied Poland, first at Sobibor and then from September of 1942 at Treblinka. And in this capacity, he had orchestrated the murder by poison gas of hundreds of thousands of human beings. Sereni asked him, was there any aspect of his activities in these camps that he had enjoyed? And he said with emphasis, human relations, <laughs> quite seriously, with prisoners. And at several points, he said that his relations with the Jewish prisoners in these two death camps had been quite friendly. <coughs> and to appreciate how remarkable a statement this is, you have to remember he's talking about in each case, each camp, a floating population of several hundred prisoners mostly men who are being kept alive only so long as they can keep the machinery of death operating, as they can serve their German masters as slaves. And as soon as they have outlived their usefulness, their lives are over. And they understand this terrible reality every bit as well as Stangl does, and yet nonetheless, his relations with them are supposed to be quite friendly. What could this mean? Well, his main example, his favorite example of his friendly human relations with prisoners in these death camps concerned a man named Blau from Vienna. One day, Blau came to Stangl's office. He, Blau came to Stangl's office, he stood to attention. He requested permission to speak. He looked very worried. It turned out that Blau's 80-year-old father had just arrived in a cattle car from Vienna. He was going to die in the gas chambers of Treblinka within the hour. Stangl replied, well, Blau, you must understand it's really quite impossible. A man of 80, by which he meant that, that since Blau's father was too old to be usable as slave labor, Blau could, that Stangl could find no excuse to postpone his death. Blau indicated that he understood this, but he just did not want his father to meet his end in a gas chamber. So with Stangl's permission, he took his father to the camp kitchen. He gave him a meal. And then he walked with his father to the door of the so-called infirmary, which is a structure disguised as a medical facility by a large red cross painted on the side. And there, at the entrance to a long corridor leading into the depths of the infirmary, father and son said their goodbyes. We'll never know what passed between the two men. But judging from the choice made by other prisoners in the same situation, we have every reason to suspect or to think it's quite likely that the younger Blau chose to not tell his father exactly what was going to happen next. And so as he was escorted down this corridor by a camp prisoner into the depths of the infirmary, the elderly gentleman from Vienna may not have sensed that anything was amiss. But at the end of the corridor, he rounded a corner, he, and he came to know his fate. As the, as the stench of rotting human flesh assaulted his nostrils as before his eyes lay the hideous sight of a pit filled with corpses of murder victims. And standing at the edge of the pit, gun in hand, was a man wearing the black uniform of the SS. And this man ordered Mr. Blau forward, made him take off his clothes, directed him to stand on a wooden plank at the edge of the pit, and murdered him with a pistol shot to the back of the neck. Later that day, the murdered man's son came back to Stangl's office and said, Herr Commandant, I want to thank you. I took my father to the, the kitchen. I gave him a meal. I took him to the infirmary. It's all over. Thank you very much. Well, Blau, there's no need to thank me. But of course, if you want to thank me, you may. What happened here? What happened here in Stangl's eyes was that Stangl had done Blau the favor of arranging for Blau's father to be murdered by gunshot instead of by poison gas. And this favor counted for Stangl among the human relations that he had enjoyed with prisoners in these camps. And Stangl's way of seeing his victims was typical, emblematic, representative of the way that so many perpetrators of the Holocaust 
thought about and felt about, or more, more to the point, did not feel about their victims. They subscribed to this racist belief system that held that Jews are less than fully human, they're inherently destructive, hence taking their lives is not only nothing to feel guilty about or ashamed about, it's nothing to even feel uncomfortable with. And they lived among their victims. In the case of some prisoners in these camps, for a period of years, saw them every day, spoke to them every day, and yet felt no apparent discomfort at this daily contact with people, all of whom they had condemned to death. This is incidentally a unique feature of the Holocaust. We find no parallel to this phenomenon of living among the condemned in any other episode of, gen of genocide or atrocity. And it teaches us something important because their attitude toward their victims reminds us of nothing so much as that of a farmer among livestock that he is destined for slaughter. And I submit to you that this way of looking at the victims goes to the very heart of why the Holocaust is so important to us and why it frightens us so much. It was a unique juncture in history in which the most educated and accomplished members of the most advanced human society chose to make a very determined statement that human life has no inherent value whatsoever. That just because it's a human being does not mean it has a right to live or has any value. And you can best appreciate the importance of this sort of abstract statement by I, I invite you to ask yourselves the question, why not? Why not commit murder? How do you know that murder is wrong? If you had to prove it, how exactly would you go about demonstrating to any of us that murder is morally wrong? You know, and to this hideous question, we, we would all have the same answer, basically, automatically. We believe that human life is precious. We believe that every individual has rights. We believe that our existence here on the planet has a meaning and a purpose and some kind of value. And these are wonderful beliefs. But that's all they are. They're beliefs. They're not facts that any of us can prove. The proposition that you and I have a right to live, that we're worth something simply because we are human beings, this is not a fact that any of us can demonstrate. It's a postulate. It's an unsupported assertion. And you can choose to accept it, or you can choose to reject it. And this choice to affirm or to deny the inherent value of human life, I would argue that this is the most important choice that any of us makes in our entire lives. And almost no one in this room is aware of ever having made it, because it's been made for us by the families into which we are born, by the people around us, by the society in which we live. It's an unstated choice. It's an assumed choice. It's a choice of which we've been happily innocent. And part of the horror of the Holocaust is that killers revealed to us, they made a theft of our moral innocence. They revealed to us the terrible truth that this is in fact a choice and that it's eminently possible to choose other than we have chosen. And they did this by themselves choosing to reject the inherent value of human life. They did this explicitly. They did this in the most uncompromising terms. They did it on a massive and an unprecedented scale. And I'll make this concrete with three examples. Because in the Holocaust, the murderers expressed their rejection of the inherent value of human life in practices and actions that were unique to the Holocaust, that find no parallel in any of their episode of, episode of genocide or atrocity. In the first place, the way that they reduced their victims to the status of material objects that they process for value, almost as if they were animal carcasses. And you're familiar with this, harvesting the teeth to melt out the fillings, using Jewish prisoners as laboratory animals for all manner of experiments. Shearing, they sheared off tons of women's hair for the purpose of making textiles. A second unique fa feature of the Holocaust is that by comparison, if you look at the Armenian genocide, the Rwandan genocide, the Cambodian genocide, the victims were all murdered for an immediate practical purpose or set of purposes. In all three cases, a purpose common to all three genocides was preserving the killer's hold on political power because their hold on power was very shaky. In the Holocaust, there was no such practical purpose. There were a few rationalizations here and there, but ultimately it happened because to the killers, the very existence of their victims was unacceptable. And so for the first and only time in our history, we have murdered millions of our fellow human beings for the purpose of taking their lives. 
Their death was an end in itself. It's a kind of philosophical moment. And this brings me to the third unique feature of the Holocaust that underpins the argument that I am making to you, and that is that the Jewish people were the only large minority in history that has been targeted for complete biological extinction. They aim to murder not just the 11 million Jews who by their count, which was inaccurate, lived on the European continent, but had they won the war in Europe, had they defeated the Soviet Union in 1941 and then turned and more easily subdued the British Isles, and thus Hitler had at his, at his disposal all of the, the manpower and the vast natural and industrial resources of the entire continent. They might have built a war machine powerful enough to overcome even us here in the Western Hemisphere. And had they done so, we are in no doubt the next step would have been to strike at every single remaining Jewish community around the globe, no matter how small. I mean, there could have been a village in Patagonia at the southern tip of Argentina with three Jewish families who survived by herding goats. And if the SS had found, gotten wind of their existence, they would have sent a death god down there to take their lives. They viewed the Jewish people the way that, as a problem, the way that, of the kind that public health organizations used to view smallpox. It's a virus. It has to be completely eradicated so that it can never, ever grow back. And in sum, what I am, the argument I am making to you is that the Holocaust, in the Holocaust, the killers have compelled us to confront, at least a little more directly than we have been forced to confront in the past, the awful question of does our life have any significance? Because they affirmed with such determination on such a massive scale that it does not. And I contend that this is why the Holocaust frightens us so much. And this is what makes it so important. And it is also what makes the Holocaust unique among not just episodes of atrocity, but among all historical events. Because the Holocaust is the historical event that, far more than any other, confronts us with questions of existential significance. I have, uh, I'll have some concluding remarks at the end of our discussion. But now I want to pause and take questions from you. Uh, and we have a good, yeah, you know, we have a good 40 minutes for questions at this point. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will call on you. And the lady in the back was first. Yeah, if you stand up, that's probably better <coughs> and project. We can stare at you. Do I have to like introduce myself? No, just ask a question. You can do that too. Oh, okay. Speak up, please. I'm Carly. Um, I'm an intern at the Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center. Um, and we have recently our team has been looking at um, the coercion of Hitler. So the Hitler Youth Programs, we believe that they offered a lot of stability and posit positivity for these children. They gave them a sense of importance and a sense of community. Um, and so it's understandable as to why they would believe in Hitler and all the other things that he was doing. Um, but we're kind of confused of the leap it's a very big jump to go from believing in Hitler to uh, being willing to give your life up for him. And so we, I would be interested in you talking about the psychology of that. That's a really interesting question. Um, I, mean, I mean, to some extent, once, once war breaks out and the German people aren't consulted as to whether or not there's going to be a world war, and indeed, we, we know a lot about German public opinion, and German public opinion, like public opinion in France and England at the same time, is actually very much opposed to another general European war. But once the war breaks out, there's a kind of compulsion in wartime, once you are drafted into the military, you know, you may not be terribly eager about giving up your life, but all these things come together, being under orders in wartime, defending your country, to what extent is enthusiasm for Hitler part of your motivation for um, being willing to, to give your life for your country, one can say that Hitler was able to make himself the symbol of German patriotism because part of what gave the Nazi movement uh, a lot of its support in the, in the 1920s and particularly during the, the, the last the, the sort of three early years of the Depression where they had their electoral breakthrough was that the Nazis presented themselves as the most ferocious critics of the people that they blamed for Germany losing the First World War, and they mounted the most sort of determined attacks and criticisms of the Treaty of Versailles, 
which, interestingly enough, I mean, the, the Treaty of Versailles is often said to have been terribly unfair to Germany. It actually, um, compared to what the Germans would have done had they won the First World War, it was, it was extremely generous and, and kind. Uh, and, and contrary to, to what was often believed at the time, it, the reparations um, demands that were um, requirements that were part of that treaty did not cripple the German economy in the 1920s. Nonetheless, the consensus in Germany was this treaty has been terribly unfair. They've taken away a lot of our territory that's partly German and Polish and given it to the Poles. And we're, we're paying these reparations. We had to admit that we were at fault in the war. Um, and Hitler, what Hitler did in his foreign policy in the 1930s, he had a series of triumphs that reversed the hated you know, conditions of the Versailles Treaty. That is, Germany was, was, was limited to an army of only 100,000 men um, by the terms of the treaty, which you, know, you could argue that was really unfair to Germany because Germany was the only country that really couldn't defend itself against its neighbors. So in 1935, Hitler just announces we're returning to a large peacetime army in conscription. Um, Germany was not allowed to have troops on the west bank of the Rhine River. In 1936, Hitler uh, remilitarizes the Rhineland, which is another sort of striking a blow against Versailles. And then in 1938, he annexes Austria. And Austria, the Aust Austrians and the Germans had wanted to unite as a single country uh, in the aftermath of World War I. And in, in a number of different ways, the victorious powers found ways of essentially giving Austria incentives powerful enough that this union did not take place. So this wasn't, in a sense, also a, a term of the Treaty of Versailles that was considered very unfair because why could not two German-speaking peoples who wanted to be the same country be the same country? It's their choice. So, but the point I guess I want to make about this in answer to your question, Carly, um, why was Hitler able to do this? He was able to do this because also in the Western Allies, in France and, and especially in England, there was a lot of opinion already that, well, these particular terms of the treaty were not so easily justifiable. They were not fair to Germany. And so Hitler, in each case, made a bold move, was pushing on an open door, and then came off looking as a genius. But, and he not only came off looking as a genius, but then also by defeating France in the spring of 1940 and avenging the defeat of World War I, he had made himself, I don't know, as, as much an icon of German patriotism as, as George Washington might be of American patriotism. And so for many, many German soldiers who went into battle and, gave, and, and lost their lives in that war, quite a few of them were dying for Hitler. When you go uh, when they were like three. Stand up. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? You mm -hmm. stand up and Even when they were like three years old and they were an infant, I don't understand how a three-year-old could be so they in love with Hitler. They didn't like that. I don't, know if, I don't know if it started quite that young. I think you, I think you began the Hitler youth, uh, the young folk, at the age of six or seven. Um, well, it's also sort of constant indoctrination, and of course there's no... The mass media are completely controlled by the government. Every message that they receive in any kind of medium in the public and also from the teachers in their schools is very much pro-Nazi party, pro-Adolf Hitler that makes Hitler sort of uh, responsible for every good thing that has happened to Germany. And so, uh, and so I, think, uh, I think his honor has the next question. Uh, using your premise that uh, the reason the Holocaust couldn't uh, happen, not couldn't happen, most likely would never happen in the United States because it's a long-established democratic uh, entity. Uh, my concern is Europe right now has, uh, especially France, has a tremendous history of a democracy, as does England and the Netherlands. Yet we read every day, and particularly in France, where 75% of the Jews are in process of leaving, because at what point, I guess my question is, where does it tip the way you think in a long-established democracy that perhaps the Holocaust couldn't happen again? Well, I think you know, that, a, that, a, that a whole a number of different things would be, would be necessary for a genocide to occur. You would need, for one thing, a support by the majority of, say, the population of France, of ethnic French, um, for discriminatory legislation against Jews. You would then need the context of, um, and, and it would, this would have to build over quite a long period of time, over a period of decades, not just a period of a year or two, and what you would need above all, though, what I think is, is perhaps the most important single ingredient for genocide that is just going to be missing is, is a major war. None of these countries um, is at all willing. I mean, you could say, okay, there's a threat from Russia of a major war, but because of the nuclear deterrent, that's really not going to happen. 
And among themselves, the nations of Western Europe, I mean the Germans, for example, those people are pacifists today. The military institution has no prestige in that country and military service is not considered an attractive uh, sort of obligation to have to fulfill. <coughs> so um, just uh, you know, aside from the fact that um, you know, in, in a modern democracy, ideas of individual freedom and protection for minority rights are so deeply ingrained, it is really very difficult to imagine in a country like France or England or anywhere in Western Europe. Eastern Europe is another matter. In the established democracies, really um, creating electoral majority even for discriminatory legislation. And then for discrimination actually to tip into murder, you, you need the context of major war. You need that level of violence. And there are several other ingredients that are, that are necessary as well. So I find that really impossible to imagine. And a uh, gentleman right there. Yes. Um, a, any political party needs major financing. Do you give any credence to the information that is about that through um, Tyson and Krupp Corporation, there was funding for the Nazi party from Union Banking Corporation in the States from Prescott Bush and other people involved with that that put enormous amounts of money at the disposal of the Nazi party that then led to the uh, steel company being able to build up and um, build armaments. There's, you know, there's, wait, wait, are you talking about after Hitler came to power? I'm talking about the early 30s, yes. Yeah, well, well I mean, are we talking about before if you're talking about the period up to Hitler taking power, which is the 30th of January 1933, there's no evidence of sub substantial American big business funding for the Nazi party. There's not even a lot of big business, German big business funding of the Nazi party. The party is mostly financed by member dues. And then some funding comes in right at the end in the last electoral successes as they begin to sense that they're betting on a winner, but that's not really what fuels the rise of Hitler. If you're talking about after Hitler takes power, uh, the willingness of American corporations to do business with Germany as they are willing even today to do business in any kind of repressive dictatorship or terrible country around the globe, uh, it's no different today than it was back then. I don't see that that has changed. It, it also is not terribly unusual. Uh, and it's also important to recognize that, well, doing business with, with Hitler as the, the persecution of German Jews began to intensify, you have to say that is morally reprehensible. On the other hand, none of the countries that are the companies that are doing business, and this is something that we have to generally keep in mind about uh, the behavior of the outside world toward Nazi Germany and the unwillingness to accept immigration from Nazi Germany during the years before World War, I be World War II began, and that is that no one had any idea that this was going to end up as genocide, because that was in a, in a Western European country unprecedented. Uh, you look like your hand up a little quickly. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I happen to be a uh, gallery educator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. And I lecture uh, exactly what you have been presenting. The interesting thing is Hitler did not build the gas chambers for the Jews. In the early 30s, six killing centers were set up in Germany for non-Jews, for those that were physically or mentally unstable. They sent doctors to the various clinics, checked the records. If this one was considered as physically deformed or mentally deformed, a bus would come, take them to one of the centers, they were put into a barn-like facility mm -hmm. and gassed. Yeah. That was the start of his uh, gas chambers. But he had to stop that because the churches Catholic Church and the Protestant churches were vehemently opposed. So for goodwill, so to speak, he stopped them. Also, when you want to answer that? Okay, well, let me just say, first of all, you're, you're <laughs> very well informed. Uh, and, that's, and you're absolutely right, except for the timing that the this, this so-called euthanasia program begins in October of 1939, after eugenics, the war is broken up. Eugenics is what was... Well, eugenics is not exactly the same thing as the so-called euthanasia program. The eugenics, eugenics is a, more generally a strategy for improving, improving the gene pool, mostly by trying to get people who are deemed to be genetically unfit to not reproduce. And this was accomplished, for example, by involuntary sterilization laws, which we also had in this country uh, even before 1920, long before they had them in Germany. And in Sweden. Um, and in a number of countries, and involuntary sterilization laws. I mean, by the 1960s in our country, I think about 65,000 people had been, had been sterilized against their will. 
Um, now, with regard to the euthanasia program, you're also quite correct that, that Hitler, he didn't end the program. What he did is he ended the gassing in these six centralized facilities, which was done by bottled carbon monoxide yeah. gas, after protests by one Catholic bishop that in a sermon that was then multiplied and copied around the country. On the whole, you'd have to say that the churches and the church hierarchies were quite passive in this matter, um, uh, just as they were completely passive and compliant with the regime when it came to the persecution of the Jews. So we should definitely not be, be racing to make the churches a hero in this, because on the whole, uh, their behavior in Nazi Germany and throughout the Holocaust, both in Germany and outside Germany, was utterly despicable. But let me now ask you, do you have a question? <laughs> no, I just wanted a statement. Okay, well, save it about there. Well, the, 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 you're, you're putting your finger on something very important. The, the process of, of evolving toward genocide and, and breaking down the inhibition on killing, it went in several stages, and one of the most important points where the German government crossed the threshold was in this so-called euthanasia program, which I guess psychologically they talked themselves into the notion that this was mercy killing and that they were actually doing a favor to these people that they were murdering. Uh, they sort of maintained this fiction, and, and in the process, uh, they committed mass murder on the scale of about 200,000 Germans by the end of the war. Uh, and they also trained uh, a, a, a cohort of men. There were 92 men who had assisted in the gassing uh, at these facilities, and, all, and these 92 men ended up man manning three of the death camps in Poland, uh, Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka, including Franz Stangl, who started out in that program. So you're all quite correct. It's a very important part of the story. And uh, yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, you said that we are safe and that you're not seeing in the near future that a war will be breaking out. With the ticking nuclear weapon of Iran, and Iran that wants to eradicate Israel, how can you still feel that as a Jew you are safe? Um, well, like my, my feeling about the Iranian bomb, I mean, you're, I think that I agree with you in the sense that I think that... It's the same philosophy as Hitler. We want to totally exterminate Israel. I, th I think that there are certainly people in the leadership of Iran who, if they could kill every single person, in Israel, every Jew in Israel, they would do it in a heartbeat. I think there's no question about it. However, uh, there is the problem. I mean, I, I would certainly not deny that... Um, Iran getting an atomic weapon is a bad thing. I think everyone can agree on that. On the other hand, I, I do feel that at times there is a certain amount of, I don't know, unrealistic thinking about what this means. Because unless the leadership of Iran, unless the leaders of Iran are suicide bombers, well, I don't, I don't think that is a real. I do not think, I do not think that is a real. Pardon me, I do not think that is a realistic assessment. Iran is a highly complex society with a very complex political system that is dominated by one figure, but ultimately he is not all powerful. There is a, a large degree of consensus that is necessary in the structures of the Iranian government. You do not rise up to the top of that system if you are a suicide bomber. And that's what that would be, would be suicide for, the, for not only yourself, but for your entire people. Because yes, Iran can make it one bomb or five bombs or ten, but Israel already has, we tend to think about 200. The Israelis don't actually admit to the the exact number that they have, but they have probably 200 atomic weapons, and they have supremacy of the skies over the Middle East. And um, yeah, it's a lot better if Iran never had this weapon, just as it would have been better in the arms race if the Soviets never had nuclear weapons. But uh, unless the leaders of a country are prepared to commit national suicide, something that even Adolf Hitler was not prepared to do, uh, at least not early in the war, um, there is a deterrent. And so I do not see that an Iranian bomb is, is going to lead uh, to a genocide against Israel, Israel, as much as they might like to do it if they could get away with it. But the fact is they can't get away with it. And I do think that is crucial. Yes, the gentleman in the back has been very patient. Uh, uh, I agree with most of your, uh, your uh, postulates and theories. However, one exception, you mentioned that the Germans and the Nazis were not punished in any way uh, if they did not want to commit some kind of punishment to Jews. Is that correct? That's, that's my argument, that if you, if you did not want to uh, participate in, in, in murder in one way or another, you, you could opt out. And in fact, not only uh, would you not be punished, but very often, particularly in the shooting squads that have been studied where, where the killing was, was very up close and personal and very bloody and psychologically very difficult, 
often, very often, on, on at least, in the case of at least seven shooting units that we can document, and it was probably true in all of them, the officers said to the men before they went into action the first time, we re we're, we're going to be shooting women and children in this village. They're all Jewish. I know that many of you have wives and children of your own back in Germany, and that for you this may be psychologically too burdensome. And if you feel that you are not equal to the task, that's kind of the standard language, we can give you desk duty, we can transfer you to another unit, and so well, on and so How do you forth. account for the many stories, including some from my own parents who are Holocaust survivors, where they saw, they saw firsthand guards who could not beat Jews to death were often punished, lost rank, transferred. Uh, this was a very common. Well, and after the war, many of, of the, of course, as they rounded up all the collaborators, they also found these guards that were not as heinous and, and, were, and were publicly, you know, uh, uh, applauded for their actions. So I can't really agree with you in, well, in any case in if the camps. You're, if, you're, if your source is the memory of survivors as to guards being punished. Well, it's not just my parents. It's, we're talking about many, many documented Holocaust survivors. Well, I know, I know it doesn't have to be just your parents. It can be a very large number of survivors. The thing is, I, I find it, for one thing, hard to believe that a prisoner in a camp is actually going to know whether or not a guard is punished for refusing to commit this or that act. Uh, maybe admonished at some point, but, but punished. I, all I can say, I stick by the, the statement that I made earlier, uh, is, is, is sort of the, the point that all of us historians at this point keep coming back to, is that you look at the, at the whole vast record of all these post-war trials. And here are these people being put on trial for participation in the Holocaust and put on trial for their lives. You're talking about a very small percentage of the people that were put on trial. Well, but the thing is, nonetheless, in all of these trials, and, it, and it's not as small a percentage as you think, not once is a defense attorney able to come up with an example of any guard, any SS man, any men in the army, any bureaucrat who signed an order, who was punished for refusing to do this. And on the other hand, we have countless examples of people who opted out, who said, I don't want to do this. I request a transfer. OK, you get a transfer. I don't want to shoot. OK, you have desk duty, and then we'll transfer you. So we have plenty of documented cases of people who opt out and suffer no consequences. We don't have a single documented case of someone who's punished. Um, that's, that's, I guess that's the evidence I stand by. There's not much else I can say to it. Uh, yes, sir. Can you reconcile the concept of an international Jewish conspiracy for communism and an international Jewish conspiracy for banking? No, there's no logic to that at all. Uh, I have to say that there just no. I mean, no. There's there's a there's there's an explanation of where it might come from. Uh, but if you if you if you want to find some logic in the in the minds of conspiracy theorists, you're going to be looking a very long time. At least in my experience, in dealing with them, um, the way that that became possible is simply that you know on the one hand there there were a number of uh, you know European Jews who were very prominent in finance, and so. It's just, well, they're so diabolical, they're capable of fostering Marxism because it serves their interest in this situation, but they'll mess with the financial system in another context. And it doesn't make any sense, and it didn't make any sense. And that's the, the thing that's, you know, one of, the, one of the more horrifying ways of characterizing, well, not one of the more horrifying ways, but for me, one disturbing way of, of characterizing what happened in the Holocaust is that six million people died for a theory, you know, in a very strange theory. Yes, sir, you've been patient. Uh, yeah, my question relates to uh, the perpetrators and the victims' relationship with God. Uh, putting aside the fact that Hitler was deified, and also separating it from relationships with organized religion. Uh, the, the, the perpetrator and the victim's relationship with God, how that might have changed pre-war, during the war, after, war, <coughs> after the war, not so much from a, a theological perspective, mm -hmm. but from a historical perspective. Okay, with, with regard to the victims, I'm, I'm going to pass on that question. That's not really my area of expertise. I've really I've tried to understand why this happened. And ultimately, why this happened had nothing to do with the reality of Jewish life and it had nothing to do with the reality of who the victims were. It was all fantasy about them that drove it. With regard to the perpetrators, you raise, I think, a very important question. I have long felt that we should consider secularization, the weakening of religious faith in Europe in the decades leading up to the Holocaust, I, I, I think that we should consider it a causal factor 
It's not as part of the standard explanation, and I didn't put it in my book because it's not part of the mainstream of scholarship. It's kind of a, you can say, an avant-garde theory. Uh, but I, I, I think it is so because I think that the, uh, the last kind of remaining barrier to this, to this killing, and it's a very frail barrier, is, is, is the notion that uh, we are all made in the image of God and that we're equal in the eyes of God. Uh, and you see, for example, in the, in the reports on German public opinion, of which the regime compiled hundreds of thousands because they were constantly monitoring public opinion, to the very limited extent that Germans expressed dismay at the persecution of Jews in Germany in the 1930s and, and, and at the murder of European Jews in the 1940s, and it's a, it's a tiny number. But to the extent that they did overwhelmingly, in their overwhelming majority, these people were either clergy or very devout laity, who were people who expressed their objection precisely in, this, in these terms, that this, this racial theory, this is, this, is, this is nonsense in the eyes of God. Uh, and what I would also say in support of this theory, and it goes rightly to your question about the perpetrators, is that although the regime in public maintained that it was not hostile to Christianity because it knew that most of the population was devout and didn't want, want to create dissent within Germany during World War II when it needed all Germans to, to come together uh, in support of the war effort, in the upper ranks of the regime, in the inner circle and among the ideologically most committed, among the men who were listening to Himmler give this speech, those people were ferociously anti-Christian. Yeah. My question doesn't relate to the Okay, then I'm just I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't relate to the organized re religion, but it, re it relates to the relationship with God and the common belief during the war uh, by the German that God was on my side. Well, How is that understood? Well, I mean, I, I don't know that there's ever been a combatant nation in any major war that didn't want to think at some point that God was on their side. That was certainly both sides in the American Civil War felt that very strongly. I also think that the Germans understood no later than the defeat at Stalingrad in February of 1943 that God probably wasn't pulling for them um, because they knew the war was, they knew the, at that point the war was lost. Um, Valerie has a question in the back. Well, just following up on that question, during the Hitler period, who, I can't remember which was the guy who was the propaganda <coughs> one, was that <coughs> Goebbels? He was in charge of orchestrating things that could be defined as liturgies. I mean, they had all the flags, they had the altar type thing where they went up the three steps. Um, they had a thing that looked like sacrifice almost with, they had fires up there on that altar. When people got married, they got a copy of Mein Kampf. Um, there was a, a kind of new religion externally invented by the Nazis that would be attractive to the affective nature of people who might like to go to whatever religion they are. So it substituted for the traditional Christian liturgical celebrations, at least that's what I think it is. And I don't think that they were that pious because I think that in World War I, you had one Christian nation killing another Christian nation. All of what was a former Christendom after Charlemagne were all killing each other. So I, how do you, why do you think it, these people were pious? Well, I, I just think that the, in the sense that most, most people in Europe at that time were still people, were, were, were Christians and they believed in God, pious at least in that sense, and certainly compared to an awful lot of us today. But after World War II, secularism, right? Well, after, after World War II, organized religion in, in Western Europe goes into very steep decline and it's much, much weaker uh, than it is in our country. The gentleman here in the middle has been very patient, so... Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. Enjoyed listening to you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm reminded, as you spoke, I think it's Professor Daniel Goldhagen's mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. on the ordinary, to quote the ordinary German, end yes. quote. And I'm wondering what's your view of how much that played a part in perpetrating the Holocaust that ordinary Germans in great numbers were really perpetrators and went along with the Holocaust. Well, the, 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 there are, you raise a number of very important questions. This is, this is one of the most controversial and uh, in, in some sense most notable books published on the Holocaust in the last two decades. This is Hitler's Willing Executioners by Daniel, jo Daniel Jonah Goldhagen, uh, which was a publishing sensation in 1996 when it came out and sold a um, very large number of copies both here and in Germany. Uh, in this room. Is that right? In this room. And, uh, and 
you know, Goldhagen's, I, I, have, I have a soft spot for Goldhagen, uh, which, which is my way of sort of prefacing about to, to say a lot of terrible things about his book. But, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I do want to I just do want to express my admiration of Goldhagen, the individual who is an extremely intelligent individual, a very dedicated researcher. And he took on this huge question about a very large part of the question of why the Holocaust happened, that is, what motivated the perpetrators. <coughs> In his doctoral dissertation, and if you look at how narrow most dissertations are, typically are, you have to say that this, um, this is really a very brave act on his part, and, and you know, he, did, he did very well by himself in it. On the other hand, it is also important to recognize that the, gold, the, the, the arguments of the Goldhagen book are not at all taken seriously by professional historians. And Goldhagen is a byword for bad history, bad argument, tendentious use of evidence. Um, you know, just selective use of evidence. Um, it's just sort of for everything bad. It's sort of if you, if you just mention the word, the name Goldhagen among academic historians of modern Germany, they roll their eyes and then some sort of epithet comes out of their mouths. <laughs> now this doesn't mean that everything that Goldhagen says is wrong uh, because historians have a, have a herd mentality like every other group of human beings and they've been wrong in their number about a number of things. But I think with regard to Goldhagen, he has two basic arguments, all right? His first argument is, that the Holocaust happened and happened in Germany because the German people were uniquely and homicidally anti-Semitic. That German anti-Semitism is far worse than anti-Semitism in every other country. That's why it happens and why it happens in Germany. The problem with that is that Goldhagen did no meaningful comparison to anti-Semitism in any other country. And this is a no-no. This is Social Science 101. You don't make an argument for national <laughs> uniqueness without conducting transnational comparison. And had Goldhagen done so, it would have been even worse for his argument. Maybe he would have stopped saying what he was saying because all you have to do is look at the history of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe and on the territory of the Soviet Union, you see that anti-Semitism is far more widespread, deeply entrenched, and violent than it ever was in Germany until Hitler came to power. For just to give you one example, in, during the Russian, the, the Russian Civil War, in 1919-1920 in Ukraine, Ukrainians by their own spontaneously massacred between 150,000 and 200,000 of their Jewish neighbors. At the high end of that estimate, that's 10% of the Jewish population of Ukraine. The number of uh, Jews who were actually outright murdered because they were Jewish in Germany, say in the 1920s, would have been counted on the fingers of one hand. Um, Russia, you can, the, the examples multiply. multiply. And, and Mammal, concentration camps were in Poland. Well, that is also true, and I'll come back to that. Okay, but and the all right. The other the other argument that Goldhagen made is not only that this you have this unique German anti-Semitism, but all Germans 100% think this way, and and thus that every German whether they are uh, rich or poor, or working class, middle class, upper class, Catholic or Protestant, think exactly the same way about the Jewish people and the Jewish question and the Holocaust as does Adolf Hitler. Now, simply as a matter of common sense, when do you find any large and diverse society where everyone is, thinks exactly the same way about an important question? Secondly, it just flies in the face of this enormous mountain of evidence that Goldhagen simply chose to conveniently disregard and overlook that there's enormous variation in the German population. Uh, yes, anti-Semitism is extraordinarily widespread in Germany even before Hitler comes to power, as it is in France, as it is here. Um, on the other hand, the, the consensus among historians, judging from what, what we see about how Germans commented on or did not comment on the the, 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 the discriminatory laws against Jews in the 30s and, and the, the the enormous amount of information that Germans got about the murders uh, during the 1940s, during the Holocaust, the, the conclusion, it's pretty much a consensus among historians, not 100%, but very close, is that the overwhelming attitude of most Germans was essentially indifference. That they increasingly came to see, well, these, these German Jews are not really German. They don't really matter terribly much to much. I don't terribly much like them. On the other hand, this is very different from full-throated support for genocide which is what Goldhagen attributes to all of these Germans. So Goldhagen gets a lot of points for courage and for his intelligence and for his skills as a researcher. On the other hand, 
for the quality of this argument, you have to say that the book is really intellectually bankrupt. And it's very important to recognize this, that this is not gospel truth. Now, I just want to briefly, you had raised the question that, uh, that the death camps are on Poland. And why did you raise that? What was the question you wanted to ask? My com uh, just a comment that Poland was exceedingly anti-Semitic, or still is exceedingly anti-Semitic, and was welcoming uh, the establishment of death camps and I, 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 Auschwitz and uh, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you that the, that the population of Poland was was virulently anti-Semitic in the 1920s and 1930s. It's going a little bit too far to say that they welcomed the establishment of death camps. And you have to remember also that the Polish population, which is frequently very harshly criticized for collaborating with the Nazis in, in revealing the hiding places of Jews, and, and a lot of these criticisms are very justified, we should all also, however, remember that uh, the Nazi occupation of Poland was terribly harsh. The number of Poles who died, mostly of starvation, but many, many tens of thousands from outside murder was between 1.8 and 1.9 million. Uh, and so the Poles themselves were desperately trying to survive and sometimes collaborating with the Germans in one way or another was the only way to put food on the table for your family. It doesn't make it right, but it does put it in a different perspective. And it's not that they welcomed Auschwitz because they wanted to see their neighbors murdered. It wasn't really quite that extreme. Uh, yes, you have a question, ma'am. Yeah, um, my parents were from Vienna, and I would say that my father's dying words may have been the title of your book. I mean, I grew up with all this. And the other thing that he used to say is, who's such a hero? And when you talk about fear, I think part of the fear is that we would be faced with something similar, but not the same, and we wouldn't be the people who would hide someone. We wouldn't be the people who would speak out. Uh, this was something that I think plagued my father a great deal, because he could, I think he understood how, you know, he asked the question, I think, he understood that it is frightening that we could be perpetrators, or we could at least be indifferent. And what I'd like to know is, um, where is the research going about people who <coughs> don't follow that and, the, and, and hit people and, and spoke up and yeah. maybe they didn't survive because they got killed for it? Ex excellent question. You know, my, uh, one of my mentors at Columbia, Istvan Dayak, who lived through World War II in Budapest, and then also in the, uh, and he, he had a very good friend of his who was uh, involved in the anti-fascist, sort of anti-German and anti-Hungarian fascist resistance who was killed in a street battle, who he talks about actually in his, in his most recent book. And I remember him saying to us in seminar in grad school at Columbia that he said, you know, I, I knew all these people who before the war and some of them behaved decently and some of them behaved despicably and most of them behaved timidly. Uh, and really didn't distinguish themselves in one direction or another. He said that nonetheless, whether you're talking about the heroes or the, or the, or the criminals, there would have been no way before the war to predict who was going to become what. And when we look also at the universe of, of rescuers, we don't find enough obvious common denominators um, to really sort of see a very clear pattern or to predict who would be, be a rescuer other than there does seem to be in in a sort of overrepresented in, a num in, in other words, in a number of cases, people who were very devout in their religious faith. And when, when there, was, uh, there was an organization in Poland that was just a very small part of the Catholic Church called Zygota that, that, special, you know, that, that hid a number of Jews, that rescued a number of Jews. Uh, likewise, Kurt Gerstein, who, who was an SS officer, who was a very devout Protestant, who um, gathered up information about the death camps and you know, made a trip to, to Rome to try to convey this information to the Vatican in the hope that the Pope would speak out. Uh, of course, going against this generalization about religious faith, somehow encouraging one to, to, to be a, in some way a, a rescuer or someone who would strike a blow for, for decency, Pope Pius XII himself during the war uh, remained completely silent about the Holocaust during the whole time, even though given that the Catholic Church has tens of thousands of priests all over, the, all over Europe, including in Poland, where the death camps are located, you know, among the only people who could have been better you know, informed than Pius about the Holocaust would have been Hitler and Himmler themselves. And nonetheless, he refuses to speak out, even though, and even in, in private correspondence, 
through diplomatic channels, he interceded on, the fa on, on behalf of Polish Catholics or uh, the German victims of the Unith Euthanasia Program. And yet in these private channels even, he never spoke up in, in, uh, you know, in, in and favor of the Jews. And the United States knew. Well, yes, and, and, let me, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. There is a widespread perception that we in this country were indifferent and that we did nothing. Actually, uh, we did issue in December of 1942 uh, the leadership, I mean, Stalin, uh, Roosevelt, and Churchill, the leadership of the three countries, issued a declaration that was broadcast everywhere and it beamed into Germany on the BBC German service saying, uh, your government is engaged in an attempt to exterminate the Jewish population of Europe guilty Germans will be punished after the war, do not participate in this. It is said that we stood by and did nothing. What we need to remember is that Hitler had military control of the entire continent. And the only way to stop the guest chambers was to defeat Germany militarily. And you know, in that struggle, we lost several hundred thousand of our young men, which I don't think qualifies as doing nothing. How about bombing the trucks? OK, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That's, I'm glad that you brought that up, because that's the, you know, the, that is the other sort of um, sin of omission that is credit to our government, which is in the spring of 1944, <clears throat> beginning in April, when the German government has, has invaded Hungary and is now able to get its hands on the Jewish population of Hungary and proceeds to ship them to Auschwitz. And this is when Elie Wiesel, for example, got scooped up and said, and of the 437,000 Hungarian Jews who were deported, 420,000 went to Auschwitz, of whom 394,000 were murdered immediately upon arrival in the gas chambers. Why didn't we bomb the tracks to Auschwitz? Why did we not try to bomb the crematoria? Um, I think it was the World Jewish Congress, but I'm not 100% sure of this, that sent an emissary to Roosevelt's government specifically requesting these military steps. And that was, that was the first point in the war in which our advanced uh, air bases were situated close enough, to the, far enough to the east that we could have done that. This request went to the War Department. It was disposed of by John McCloy, which was a, a high-ranking official, who simply said, there's no military necessity served here. Right. Why that decision was, the, the fact that this idea was not discussed more seriously and more thoroughly uh, is just reprehensible. There's, there's just no other word for it. Was this in some, was this? Excuse me, was vehemently opposed, and he also went to Roosevelt and put enough pressure against Roosevelt against, I'm sorry. To prevent, to prevent this from happening. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you for supplying that information because that is, you are probably better informed on this particular point than I am. Um, did anti-Semitism play a role in this refusal to consider this, to, to consider this step? I don't know. I'm not aware of a smoking gun in the archives of any document that says, well, this is only Jewish victims, therefore we don't care. However, I will also say that in some sense, this is, a, this is kind of a red herring. Yes, it should have been considered more seriously. On the other hand, would, could any lives have been saved by this step? Of that, I am very skeptical. First of all, because aerial bombardment at that time was extraordinarily inaccurate. The crematoria of Auschwitz are hard targets. They would require direct hits or several. Railroad tracks are very easy to, to repair and very hard to hit. And the final point that's the most important is that even if they had destroyed the tracks leading to Auschwitz and even if they had knocked out the gas chambers and crematoria, as long as the Germans could get their hands on these victims in Hungary, their, their fate was sealed. They would have just taken them off the train and shot them by the side of the railroad tracks. They shot over two million people over the course of the war. So I don't think that this intervention really would actually have saved lives. In that sense, there wasn't a lost opportunity. On the other hand, the fact that it was not seriously considered is reprehensible. I'm going to take just two more questions, and then I have to wrap up. Uh, j yes, sir. Uh, it's you. Oh, I'm the, uh, go ahead. Oh, Can you comment on the role of the Vatican or the Catholic Church during World War II in respect of these murders in those concentration camps? Okay, I, 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 I had talked about that briefly, but just to, just to repeat, the, the Vatican itself remained completely silent, even though being very well informed about, about the Holocaust. As to the churches, the sole cases I can think of, of, of any church voicing some objection to the deportation of Jews, there were some complaints made by the Catholic Church in France about the deportations of French citizens. 
There was also a protest that when the first deportations were ordered from Amsterdam, there was actually a, a, a strike by labor unions, there was a protest by university students, there was a protest by the churches, none of which really changed the outcome, but it's really the sole, these are the sole examples of decency on the part of these institutions who claim for themselves the role of the moral conscience of the society in which they live. And you look particularly at the, role, at the, the, at the, the record of the German uh, churches in the 1930s as the regime immediately begins declaring that they're, uh, you know, that proceeding with the persecution of, of German Jews, even when it came to Jews whose families had confer, converted to Christianity often generations before, these churches moved very quickly to exclude these racially Jewish Christians who were part of their congregation. They did it with alacrity. So you have to say all in all that the, especially when measured against the role that a church should perform in a society, you have to say that their behavior is nothing short of disgusting. Uh, and sir, now you had a question. Yes, you did. Nazi, <laughs> sorry. Nazi propaganda sorry. <laughs> was very efficient, very powerful, sorry. had a great deal to do with that mindset that you talked about that people had about the Jews and the victimization yeah. of the Jews. And had uh, social media been around in those days, mm -hmm. obviously the Nazis would have used it very much to their advantage. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, had social media been around and there were videos of the cattle cars going by with human cargo mm -hmm. and Jews being rounded up and herded off to the ghettos and random killings of Jews in the street, could that have been used as a detriment? Could there could that have caused a groundswell that may have changed the tide of history? I, you know, that's, that's over my pay grade, you know. <laughs> I mean, really, figuring out, figuring out what the role of, the role of Facebook, I, I look, it's a, it's a fast, sir, it is a fascinating question. I'm not suggesting that your question is not an important question or not an interesting question. It's a fascinating question. It is a question that I feel very poorly yeah. qualified to answer, particularly since I can't even figure out how to man my own f Facebook page. But, but I will say, well, I mean, I think going forward in, in, uh, in, in episodes of, I mean, in episodes like the, the Arab Spring, often social media were used to mobilize people against mm -hmm. governments. So I think there is obviously, there is possibly a very positive potential there. With regard to, well, you know, uses it to recruit. Yeah. So that, that is also true. I, 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 uh, I, I think I'm going to hold off on pronouncements about social media. It's also my, it's not my generation. And I'm, I'm afraid that's going to have to be the last question because they do need to wrap up. Um, oh, but I'm not done yet. No, 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 I'm not done yet. I, I, have, I have some conclusions. Stop, don't leave, please. <laughs> oh, well, go well. Anyway, okay, listen, if only one person escapes after the questions, that's not so bad. Look, um, I became a historian in no small part to, to be able to confront the existential challenge of the Holocaust, that is the killer's statement that human life, including mine, has no inherent value whatsoever. Now hundreds of millions of people have seen movies, read books about the Holocaust, and hardly any of them have been so as powerfully affected by this basic truth as I have. And I've often wondered, you know, why was I different? And I don't have a, I don't have an adequate answer to that question other than one that goes in the direction of my being very weird and I, I really don't want to go there. But I do think that a part of it that has been important in my biography, my trajectory, is that I never really had, and this is not a complaint directed against my parents, but I never had any kind of religious education at all, I, or hardly any. And I never had any belief in God. I'm not an atheist, but I just, I've never had any kind of faith. And you know, if you do have some measure of religious faith, the existential questions are rather more manageable for you. You know, your life has value because you are created in the image of God. And your life has meaning because God put you here on earth for a purpose. But if you're like me and you've got no faith, you're not made in the image of God. You're just a glorified monkey clinging to an asteroid. And the existential questions, you have to face them alone. And that can be hard. And the only answer that I have found to this rather grim situation is to embrace, or at least to try to embrace, to do my best, to embrace an unconditional love for all human beings. That the way it works for me is that my life has value because I'm human and all human life has value and I am deserving of love because all human beings are lovable. 
And I'm not unique in this in any way. I think it works this way for a lot of us. It's just that most people don't feel the need to make a philosophical statement of it. In any case, nothing challenges this, any notion of love for humanity the way the Holocaust does. And Elie Wiesel put it best. He said the opposite of love is not hatred. The opposite of love is indifference. And we saw this indifference in the way that Franz Stangl viewed and treated the Blau family in Treblinka. He didn't hate them, but he cared so little about them that murdering them was just a job. And it wasn't even a stressful job for him. People ask me, they ask me all the time, why did they hate the Jews so much? People assume, and, and this is the most reasonable and natural assumption to make, that the Holocaust was fueled by an especially passionate form of hatred. And you know, to this, to this I can only say we should be so lucky. We should be so lucky. Because hatred is a relationship among human beings that at least to some degree acknowledge each other's humanity. We care about people we hate. They are important to us. And yes, in the Holocaust, killers, most of the killers did feel some hatred for their victims, no question, but that's not the predominant motive. The signature mental state of the Holocaust perpetrator, I would argue it's what makes the Holocaust the Holocaust. The signature mental state of the Holocaust perpetrator is not hot, passionate hatred. It is an indifference so cold that mass murder inspired in these killers no emotion more powerful than the disgust that you feel when you step on a cockroach in your kitchen. That's what genocide was to these people. It was stepping on insects. Well, love for humanity has sort of been my way of making sense of my place in this world. And the Holocaust is the ultimate negation of that love, of any notion of love for anyone. So I needed to know how this could happen. I needed to understand what this says about us. I'll start by what it does not say. Holocaust doesn't demonstrate that we're evil. And by evil, I should define it. What I mean is happily doing something that you know is morally depraved. You know from your life experience, there are very few people like that out there. They're called sociopaths. Yes, you've encountered people who've hurt you in your life, people who have treated you in an unethical manner. But even these people all have to go home and look themselves in the mirror and justify what they did to you. Like us, like everyone, almost everyone, they need to see themselves as morally upright, as decent, and as kind. And in this, the murderers in the Holocaust did not differ from us one iota. The hard part, the difficult part, as, I, as I've already mentioned, is how to maintain sight of what is morally right and decent and of who deserves your kindness when circumstances change dramatically enough because we don't have that moral compass. We lack that gyroscope that could keep us morally on the straight and narrow no matter how much our circumstances change, no matter what the people around us are doing. And so the Holocaust does prove, it doesn't prove we're evil, but it does prove that if you educate us with the wrong ideas and if you put us under the wrong government and if you place us in the wrong circumstances, we are capable of anything, no matter how depraved. There is no floor in moral terms below which we cannot sink. However, the most important word in this equation is if. And in the world's democracies, in the 70 years since the end of World War II, we have by and large been teaching ourselves the right ideas about racism or about tolerance. We have been living under the right kind of government and strengthening that, that is democracy. We have by and large avoided the circumstances, that is major warfare, in the history of our country, the Vietnam War is the biggest exception, avoided the circumstances that foster cruelty. And so we have, ha we have in these countries not only made for us genocide a future impossibility, we have built societies that are morally superior to everything in human history that came before. You know, our species still in moral terms has a long way to go, but we have made a lot of progress. And if we are to make future progress, we have to acknowledge the progress we've made so far so that we can have some confidence in our ability to do better. And so as a historian, I have to say that, you know, one of the most wonderful things for me about writing this book is I finally arrived at an explanation of this event that I am able to reconcile with my fundamental optimism about the human future, an optimism that I think is well grounded in my understanding of the historical record. So in closing, there are two things I want for you, two things I want you to get from reading my book. 
First, I hope and I, and I rather expect that by the time you are done reading it, you will feel confident that you understand how this could happen, that this will no longer be a mystery to you. And I also hope that you will come to see the Holocaust from what I think is the proper perspective. Yes, on the one hand, it's quite possibly the most depraved thing that human beings have ever done. By my standards, certainly it was. And thus, not just as something that, we, yeah, we remember it happened, but as a warning to us that must always remain not just in our memory, but vivid in our memory and all of its horror. But on the other hand, no, not as our destiny. And never as an excuse for pessimism about the future of humanity. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>